Hey everybody. Hi Amy. Someone from here. Started. Let's see a fair amount of people here. You know there are a couple who couldn't make it. I think uh, Victoria is out of town, I think, and Christine was unavailable as well. Lisa is looking for an invitation. I think she was trying to reach you, Shannon. Oh, I didn't see that. Um, Adam, can I forward Lisa my panelist link, or does she need, does she need a unique panelist link? I'll forward her mine. I think all it does is come on with my name, but I don't think that. Hang on one second. Um, does anyone, is everyone else sound okay? I think that's just my computer. You're a little spotty for me to hear, Amy. sound better? You're still pretty quiet. Hmm. Okay. Well, we'll see. Just use your mom voice, Amy. What's that? Just use your mom voice. Use my mom voice. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. I think we can probably manage. Use it. A while. Trying to get a... <laughs> All right. Um, Did Lisa, was Lisa able to join? I, I just forwarded her my panelists link. Um, I don't see her on yet, though. Yeah, I don't see her. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's go ahead and get this started, just because we have another meeting um, right afterwards, so hopefully she will be on soon. So I got the agenda out really late. Sorry, guys. Um, but just want to um, run through the first three few things a little quickly and then uh, Lance has uh, quite a bit of information to present to us. So I'll call the meeting to order at 4.06. Um, first up is approval of the meeting minutes. So I will um, take a motion. 
Second. Third. Motion. Motion from Shannon. Is there a second? Jeannie, second. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Um, I'll go through. Stephanie? Yes. Cannon? Yes. Don? Abstain because I was not at the meeting. Okay. Ellen? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Tom? I will abstain because I wasn't at the meeting either. Okay. Yeah, we've lost you, Amy, your audio. You want a committee updates, subcommittee updates? Yeah, great. Okay, so we'll start with um, PR. I think that was first on the agenda. And um, we've been, the PR subcommittee is really in just sort of a preparatory period. We um, met with uh, community volunteer, Tim Atkins, who has very graciously um, offered his time and professional expertise to build a website and post a website for us to use for this project. Um, checked in with Tim today. He is, uh, he has a lot of documents from Ann and I um, that, that La Valley Brunsinger has worked on, notes from our meetings, things of that nature, and he's currently building a draft um, test site for us. Uh, it's still under construction, so he wasn't ready to um, to share it with us all here tonight, um, but something should be ready later next week. So we'll be uh, checking in with him and then bringing that forward to the group um, as a way to, to really uh, have a, a spot for the community to, to get a real inside look um, at all the work that's been taking place with the Joint Facility Advisory Committee. So that's our update. And I think the next update uh, is Sauhegan 2.0. And Stephanie Grund is going to be presenting that tonight. And you, you need a screen share, is that right, Stephanie? Yeah, I do. Okay. And if you could set her up to screen share if, if that's not already possible. And also, um, if Adam, not, I can just talk through it. It's not a problem. Okay. okay. Can you send Lisa Eastlin a panelist so, link also, sure. Adam? So Thanks. sharing is all set, Stephanie, and I'll, I'll get Lisa right now. Uh, where is it showing? Oh, it's not showing up in my thing. Oh, sure it is. Okay. My sound better now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Is that on for you guys? Is my screen share on or not? No. No. All right. It's acting funny. All right. I don't know. It's, it doesn't seem like it wants to share. My iPad's acting funny. All right, I'm not going to hold it up. Um, I can talk through it. So we um, sat with Lance and his crew and talked about uh, different priorities. And we, the first thing we had come to a conclusion of was we knew that the HVAC was being brought um, forward with uh, all the COVID issues and it was probably gonna be addressed by the Sohegan School Board. So we kind of said, we're gonna push that aside and not make that a joint facility committee. We're gonna let the school board discuss that. So we kind of separated that as an issue. Um, then we said, you know, what, we're, what we need to figure out is how can we package up everything? Because with the amount of uh, spending required for all of Sohegan 2.0, we figured let's figure out packages we can put together so he's working on that and um, putting some things together. One of the things we do know, mechanical and maintenance, we know there's several systems that are approaching life. So I know Lance is taking all that into consideration, helping us with that. Um, another issue that we're looking at is, we know we've been talking about science labs for a while. And when you look at all the Sohegan 2.0, there's a lot of science labs being asked for. And we are, are wondering, how many are needed, what's needed. So it really goes to Mike Ferry 
and Lance was meeting with Mike to discuss those issues, like how many do we need? What do they need to look like? Are they chem labs? Are they, you know, general science labs? Are they environmental labs? What is it he's looking for for the future? So that's another piece that we're gonna meet about um, probably next month, Lance, I'm thinking, okay. So that's, an, that's uh, another priority of ours. And uh, also looking at the media center uh, with the structure of the school day right now, the kids might be needing space that they can go and work individually. And we think that the media center might be a, a great thing to maybe concentrate on in the Sohegan 2.0 to give that flexible space where kids can go work. Um, so that's another piece of, the, of in, something that we're interested in. And then uh, one more piece is security. And taking into account everything that we've discussed in the past with community council, um, with school boards, you know, what does the security of the school need to look like and looking at like the entrance to the building. So we're kind of exploring those ideas to make sure that the school is safe, that the kids are safe, um, but making sure that we do take into account all the other uh, groups that have, have looked at security in the past to make sure that we are using that information as well. And then the other piece is, is the locker rooms. We know those are a big problem. Um, this, and the reason we are kind of pushing those up as a priority is this might be the time to do it. If, if sports are not happening, if sports are happening, there may be an opportunity to work on those locker rooms if they're not being used as much. So we're considering moving that priority up as well. So, um, but again, a lot of this is gonna come down to once we are able to meet, meet with Lance in September and what kind of packages he can help us put together, how everything will start falling into place. So we're really looking to come back to um, JFAC, I believe uh, in September, end of September, early October with more information on maybe what we're solidly looking at doing first and how those packages might look. Jeannie, do you have anything to add to that? Um, the only question mark that um, I recall us having is um, whether the annex would be um, a steam center, yeah. so to speak. Um, and that's part of Mike Berry conversation, yeah. Right. Yeah, that was a that's that's right, Jeannie. That was a that was a great point. We thought, you know, with everything we're looking at, is there a possibility that the annex itself could become like almost like a, a steam center, science center? So that's a consideration. I believe Lance is having a conversation with Mike just to see if that's something he's thinking about, could think about. Again, another thing up in the air. <laughs> and obviously, nice. Mike has a lot on his plate right now with school opening. Yes. So we're trying to be respectful of that, um, let him get through that school opening process. Um, and then Mike and I can start working. In the meantime, we are trying to break all the, the estimates out um, so that when we do meet with Mike and we meet with a group that we know the cost of each piece so that we can start packaging those into projects. Yep. So that's where we are. Um, just a reminder, if you're not talking, just make sure you keep yourself on mute because um, otherwise it'll pop up as a full screen. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Did anyone, any questions for Stephanie on the work that they're doing? I think this is great that we're um, actually finally able to, to dig in and pull the things out that we want to take a look at. And then we'll have work later on when we look at the overall master plan and how we prioritize, but this is the first step in figuring out what the actual work is that we want to um, concentrate on. So any questions for Stephanie? I, I, I don't know if um, I, we will be having a Sohegan board update, which intersects with what Stephanie was talking about with the HVAC. So we can save that conversation or have it now. It's the only question I have, and I'll be brutally honest, I have not been following everything as closely as I should be. I've deferred quite a bit to my wife, who's thankfully taken the horns on that one. Is there anything we're obligated to do by law that has to be done? You mean like in terms of um, code violations or COVID requirements? 
Yeah, Amy, so I, let me clarify this yeah. question. So of all the things that we're looking at potentially accelerating, um, you know, if we're looking at retrofitting buildings, if you are required by law to do something for the health and safety of the students, the faculty, administration, then it's a no-brainer. If it's a matter of there's choice, right? We don't have to do it. It's in the best interest of people. If it's a big ticket item, how do we make the decisions whether or not we move forward with, you know, if you're replacing an entire HVAC system, that's not like nickels and dimes. That's, that's significant infrastructure. And if you're doing that, and you're also proposing it augmenting all three or four of these facilities, how do we do that in a sound way that aligns to what we believe to be the strategic vision of these facilities as they move forward? Because you don't want to have like throwaway materials, you know, a year or two later. So how do we make sure we're, we're picking and choosing the right slots to slot into? And then, you know, having to make hard decisions to say, I get everyone's hypersensitive to everything that's happening right now, um, but is it worth spending $10 million? It's a horrible question to ask people to say, do you, health and safety for children, 10 million bucks. But at the end of the day, there are taxpayers involved. And, and some people are going to say, I want to save 10 million bucks. I really don't give a crap about a kid. And that's just the reality of it. And I just want to make sure we're making those thoughtful decisions and putting that all on the table to say, these are real hard dollars and cents of, of Amherst and Mount Vernon taxpayer dollars in question. And there's also the health and safety and what do we have to do by law and then what's discretionary? Yeah, and I'll, I'll start and then certainly um, I'll look to, to Adam and, and Lance to weigh in, but I think that's really our task as the next step that I was um, alluding to is really being able to all of the for a long time and looking at the next year by year. So those will be our tough decisions to make uh, as far as recommendations to the board. Um, and I would love to add and, and as far as what is legally required of us to do. Um, I was also going to ask Roger to um, give us a little more information on the state of the HVAC at the high school. Um, but and we can do that now, or we can do that during the Sohegan board update. But I guess I would ask for Adam and Lance to weigh in on on your um, on your question and comment. Yeah, and, and I'll defer to Lance on code related issues. But I'm not aware of any legally required updates to anything right now uh, that I'm aware of. If there was, COVID wouldn't have changed that uh, status, meaning we would have already have had to address those uh, code related issues for some other reason. Um, in the past couple of years, the only thing that rose to that level that I'm aware of uh, was security related concerns at Sohegan with the physical building itself. And we addressed that two years ago. And then at Clark School with the, the failed septic and the things that we uncovered during that process that we found to be uh, unknown violations that we uh, addressed during that um, septic upgrade. Um, so nothing that we've talked about is either is is a requirement by law, but uh, to your point, Brian, I would say that the, the the hope for this committee is that we would thoughtfully look at all of our HVAC related things and sequence them appropriately based on all of the other long range facility needs we're contemplating. Um, we've 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 changed our plan. We're not asking for a special meeting in any district at this point to accelerate our HVAC forklift upgrades, but this committee, I think that's risen to the surface is, do we address those things more quickly than we thought before COVID-19, as long as we're not throwing good money after bad um, in the process, to your point. But Lance, anything I missed there? No, I, I think you're, you're accurate, Adam. I, I, we haven't seen anything that is a code required, you must fix this now or you're in trouble. Um, as always, when we start making upgrades to the building, we must follow current codes. So there will be building codes that are activated um, and some upgrades as we do them, we, we essentially, um, things like lights. Um, if we pull down some older lights, they must be replaced with LEDs because the current energy code requires it. Same thing with HVAC systems. When we do a new HVAC system, we're required to design, design to the current ASHRAE code, um, which is consistent with, with our COVID planning um, 
markers that we're trying to plan for. Um, to answer your question, Brian, on good money after bad, you know, you guys are in a great state, particularly at the high school, where you know where you're going to be in 10 or 20 years. So when we do that system replacement, even if we're designing the system for today, we can design the system for the future. So like you said, we're not going to put a system in, pull half of it back out and put it back in in a future phase. We can set up systems that um, the ductwork, the sprinkler system, the fire alarm, all of the systems that kind of tie together um, can stay put and the renovations down the line are actually more affordable because we've already done this piece of it. Um, and that's our goal with this and everything we've talked about to date has been um, in speaking with the engineer, let's make sure that this system works for the current layout of the high school as well as anything we change in the future. So that's our goal and um, that's part of being good tenants with taxpayer dollars. Um, and to that end, I mean, we're, you know, today and several times we've talked about budgets. We're talking about budgets that are at the upper limit and we're trying to come in below that and really refine our scope to make sure we can save dollars and not spend any more money than we have to to accomplish our goal. Um, to your, you know, understanding taxpayer is not a bottomless pit. So we want to be good stewards of their dollars and have a lot to show for what they invest. Does that answer your question for now, Brian? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those are the right answers, right? I mean, we should be doing what is thoughtful and logical. I just want to make sure that we're not being, you know, reactionary uh, and, and jumping the gun to address certain, you know, faculties or, or uh, instruments, you know, because we are, because of a pandemic that's, you know, you know, hit the globe. I mean, there's plenty of infrastructure that's just as well suited for this facility or that facility that people are going in and out of every day. That are we accelerating plans to meet kind of a, a recent squeaky wheel, or are we making very sound, just decisions? Um, I, I think the latter is the most important thing. Is that we're not being reactionary; we're, we are being proactive. We're making data-driven decisions. We're being thoughtful in terms of how we're you know, making investments across the community for decades to come. And it, it you know. I don't want to have any quick fixes. That's not that's not an ideal situation to be in. That's my right. opinion. I'm, I'm one of many voices. Piggyback on you there, real quick. Um, I think the HVAC has sort of it's it's been a topic of discussion even pre-COVID. So that's kind of why that's you know rising to the surface right now. And then the work that the South Eagan 2.0 subcommittee that they're undertaking, and and Stephanie did a great job summarizing. But I know. That subcommittee has met numerous times and they're really digging in. The whole point of the subcommittee is to do exactly what you're, what you're saying, is to really look at it and say, wow, this is a beautiful plan, South Eagan 2.0, but what do we really, what do we need? Where are the priorities? How do we sequence that? So that's, that's and correct me if I'm wrong, Stephanie or, or Jeannie, but that's really your focus, right? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. We're trying to make sure that it, everything aligns to what their what they um, the visions are, but at the same time making sure that you know if we want to put something in, make sure that we can realistically make it happen and get it passed, and that we're not um, we're making sure we put things in order that again we're not ripping up something that we previously put in. So yeah, there's like it's a multi-layered yeah. effect. All right, great. Thank you, Stephanie the update. I know you guys have been um, meeting frequently and doing a lot of work. So really appreciate you and um, Victoria and Jeannie, the three of you guys. Um, Lisa, Lisa also. And Lisa, right. Yeah, thank you all. Um, I know it's, it's a tall task. All right, so next on the agenda is um, an update on the Amber School Board meeting. Um, that recently happened, so just and how that ties in with uh, our work. So, of a coin, either Ellen or Tom, if you guys want to, um, to jump in and give us an update, that would be great. Sure, Amy, you're, you're breaking up a little bit. No, I'm sorry, my internet is awful. I don't know what is going okay, on. But... Hey, go off the video, you might have a little more. Uh, All right. You want a bandwidth of video, probably. Is that better? 
It sounds like you'd like an update from the Amherst School Board on, um, did you want to talk about unreserved fund balance decisions or did you want us to talk about potential HVAC decisions? Um, I guess both. Uh, definitely what you guys, uh, what your, your final determination was on the fund balance and then I know have a discussion on um, potential HVAC work and how that intersects with JFAC. Sure. So, Tom, if it's okay with you, I'm going to give you the unreserved fund decisions we made and then I'll take the HVAC because it's easy. So, um, we had a long-term plan discussion about HVAC and the possibility of starting that earlier rather than later to adequately get in line um, before distributors and mechanics or whatever were too busy. Um, I'll just summarize, we had a discussion about it um, and after discussing the, the fiscal needs for COVID costs, we decided as a board not to move forward with the HVAC. Um, we felt that in collaboration with JFAC, some decisions needed to be made in terms of especially the Wilkins and Clark buildings. Um, it would be difficult to see any work done at Clark at all. Um, and then we questioned Wilkins potentially with our hope to redo that building. We did discuss that it sounded as though any updates we made to Wilkins could be incorporated into um, the building change. I think that a couple of the school board members, myself included, felt that the timing was not great for our community in terms of what a lot of people are dealing with. Um, you know, I'll let Tom talk about the unreserved fund balance, but um, we did not want to add to any fiscal commitment at this time. Yeah, and I think, uh, thank you, Ellen. The biggest focus for us, or for me, I should say, and I think that what we came out of it with the board was that we basically, we essentially authorized the school district to apply to the state for permission to use our, the remainder of our unassigned fund balance, which included revenues from last year. It was roughly 1.5 million um, after, originally back in April or June, May, June time we time frame, we said we're gonna return a, a million to taxpayers, the balance the schools can use to improve things as they see fit. They ended up using some of that for COVID related stuff uh, and then for to fix a couple of things that were at the end of last year. And now we have another, we have a total of 1.5 left over. So we have approved them to use that and to apply to the state to use that, which uh, the governor actually on the day that we had our meeting signed an executive order saying that schools could actually apply to the DOE to use that money. Um, so it'll be 1.5, give or take, um, that'll be expended. A lot of it's on PPE and a lot of it's on staffing. Uh, but there is some balance left over for potential short-term HVAC projects, um, you know, DDC control switches uh, to get better ventilation. Uh, there's, we're basically giving the school district, the, or the administration, I should say, permission to stay under that 1.5 cap to, to fix what they can out of the stuff that's necessary. And then any short-term HVAC fixes like filters and like DDC switches um, for better reporting and monitoring of the system to be able to, um, to fight through this stuff as we open up schools uh, next week. So. Um, no impact on taxpayers, but nothing coming back to taxpayers either um, in December like we had originally planned. But we thought that this was the most fiscally prudent way for money that is, in a lot of ways, already been spent. They're, you know, store credit at this point as opposed to having to take money out of their pocket. Great. Thanks, Tom. Any questions for Tom? Uh, I have a question. I don't know if it's really for, for Tom or maybe Roger can answer or, or maybe it's just not ready for anyone to speak to it. But you mentioned that that 1.5 is going to be used for a variety of, of items, uh, mostly related to COVID. I'm curious um, of that. What are we doing, you know, with the buildings? You mentioned filters. Is there anything specific that we can, can hear about? <clears throat> Actually, or what do you, I'm sorry. Do you mean what's on our, our updated plan anyways, or related? Yeah, to I guess like, is there anything that's happening with that money in, in relation to the buildings that we need to kind of know about? That's a good question. Tom did, and Adam maybe could chime in. We had discussed a number of items and I'm 
drawing a blank right now. Are those items still going to follow through with the 400,000, I think it was? Yeah, like the air ducts were supposed to be cleaned out at one point with some of the UFB. Um, I guess, has there been anything added to the list from what was that, May, of the May meeting? Um, we talked about it in May and then approved from? it in June. Yeah. Yeah, no, nothing that we haven't discussed uh, publicly, certainly, and all of it is is things that will um, dovetail with everything we're talking about here at JFAC. There's nothing that's incongruous with our long-term plans. Okay, thanks. And and just chiming in real quick, we did clean air ducts at our um, schools this year. That was something that um, with the the um, fund balance at the end of the year we cleaned um at middle school we did the gymnasium we did the media center and we did the cafeteria and kitchen at wilkins we did the multi-purpose room we did the library and then we did six classrooms and then at clark school we did the it was well last year i will say it was the art and music room it's the older portion of the building the second story and then we also did the multi-purpose room um, and that's already completed Super. Thank you. I have a quick question for um, Tom and I guess Ellen. Um, you know, there was a lot of PR um, value in the amount of money that you all were returning, um, which I believe you did publicize um, back in uh, when you made that decision. And I, um, I just wondered if the, if there's going to be an attempt to um, just explain why that's not happening anymore and to also explain that it's going to be put to good use because I think the public will um, you know there'll be a lot of value in in making making it clear you know that, that this is going to be used wisely. Yeah thanks Jeannie I will communicate that with our chair um, and I'm sure in our letter to the editor um, and we've got some other communication tools that we're working on we could share it um, as well. So it, you're right. Um, certainly, hindsight is 2020. Regretful that um, you know we were excited, and then obviously things changed a bit. So I'll share that with Beth um, and let her know that would be a good communication thing. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Ellen. Um, next, can you guys hear me well or you can now? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so the next up is the Sohegan um, board update. So we had a meeting um, as well and discussed utilizing the unassigned fund balance um, for um, some immediate uh, needs at the high school, primarily due to COVID. 19 preparedness, uh, including PPE. All right, I'm sorry. Right. We can't hear you. You uh, can't. Okay. It's, it's all choppy. All right. Okay. Hey, Roger, would you be able to go through um, what Sohegan is using those like, balance for? If I remember correctly, I thought we were going with, um, are we going with the short-term plans, upgrading the DDC controls for Sauhegan? And we're also continuing with item number two, which is the filter upgrades as well. And then I don't know where, I, I apologize, I don't know where we left off with the long-term plan as far as replacing the units or, or not. Adam, can you fill in? I have the list, but. <laughs> I, I can hear you now fine. Uh, so go ahead if you want to, Amy, but I'm happy to jump in too. Just go ahead. It seems to be coming in and out. Yeah, so uh, at Sohegan, it's really about the controls. Um, there was nothing else uh, besides uh, some repairs to um, unit ventilators that were not allowing fresh air to come in. Um, and so there was a, a, a good amount of uh, repairs to those unit ventilators to ensure uh, uh, fresh air is being brought into the buildings um, with our existing units. Um, that is an area where 
that might be good money after bad because those units will likely not be part of our long-term solution, but we have to have those repairs done uh, for this coming school year. Uh, and, and that's the majority of it, besides what Roger mentioned with DVC controls and filter upgrades. Um, can you talk about the staffing and equipment and cleaning supplies? Oh, okay. Yeah. Beyond that, yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and I don't have a list in front of me, so I'm, I'm speaking from memory, but I can pull it up. Um, but we have some, uh, some minor staffing that we need to cover um, to, to fill out the building staff and make sure we have appropriate staffing. Um, we certainly have cleaning supplies that we need to buy over and above what we had anticipated for the year. Um, PPE for our staff and for the nurse's office that needs to be provided for them and extras for students that show up that don't have any. And that really is the bulk of it. There's some minor things. Yeah, like some minor equipment, furniture, yeah. whatnot, yeah. Yep. Okay. Radio, some furniture, that sort of thing. Yeah, great. And then um, the board also agreed to pursue um, looking at replacing the HVAC that we've already talked a little bit about. Um, and we, we directed the superintendent to um, go down that path and start the process. Um, I wanted to ask Roger if he could just uh, give us a, um, I guess a status of the HVAC currently at Sohegan and uh, why or why not this is a, a good decision for the board to be looking at. So I, I can speak to what we see there. Um, right now, Sauhegan's design is there's unit ventilators throughout every classroom, which comes with um, just long-term maintenance in the future as far as maintaining so many individual units. The controls upgrade we're doing right now in, as Adam mentioned, in tandem with actually repairing the units is going to allow us to first off have a functioning unit to be able to bring fresh air, modulate our heat and cooling where we're able to. Um, and our control system will actually really give us an in-depth look into the systems as far as not actually being at the unit, but being able to go in, see what's working, what's not working, um, and really make adjustments as far as how much fresh air we have coming into the building. We can actually coordinate it with building schedules so that as classrooms are changing, we're ramping up the speed so that we're actually getting more air change over rate. We can slow that down as classes are actually in, in session. It's just um, pretty much, we're going to have the ability to, to really dial in our systems to do what, what is needed for an appropriate environment and be able to adjust that as time goes on as well. Um, to figure out what is working for us and what isn't working for us and really, really dial the system in as, as we move forward. As, as far as the systems there, there's a lot of age systems in there that quite frankly, really just haven't, haven't had, um, haven't had proper maintenance throughout the years, keeping their eyes on them. Um, school maintenance, although there is the, the best intentions that goes behind it, sometimes it's about, um, solving the issues that at hand. I can, I can see that sometimes when there's a lot of overheating issues that I can see that has gone on because quite frankly, the valves have just been popped off or just removed or, or just valved off because there was a complaint in a room and to solve that issue, maybe because there were students in there, the valve was just turned off. Um, what happens with that is, is that typically sometimes you don't go back to that unit and that valve staves off for, for many, many years. Um, so the existing systems just are, are a lot of, they're just in need of attention and really not only are we fixing them now and not only do, would we, although not only do we need to maintain them now, but even if we get a new infrastructure, we, we still have to be maintaining them constantly. Just getting new things doesn't mean we stop looking at them. It's just a constant and repetitive um, just cycle, just constantly going back to these units and ensure that they're, they're working all of their components. I hope that that helps answer your question somewhat. So this is the existing or the um, the original HVAC that was put in when the building was built. Is that correct or no? I can say that the unit ventilators, I think, are original to the building. I want to say at some point or another, you may have gone through a rooftop change out. I, I'm not too sure. The rooftop seen a little bit newer, but the unit ventilators seem to be existing. Yeah, and, and I, I, can on, 
I yeah, can sorry. comment on that. The uh, and Jeannie will know this. That was it the the Gale report that um, created a ten year plan for uh, upgrades at Sohegan for the facilities that completed I think five years ago. Everything except the parking lot repaving and part of that had uh, RTU replacement. Jeannie, does that sound right? right? Yeah, right. I think that was in two thousand ten. Thank you. And they had a, I think a five year plan. Yeah. yeah and. And Steve, I, luckily, Steve did have a copy of that report and, and dropped it off, and I have it in my office as well. It's um, actually really good information to have on hand. Do we have a maintenance contract with an applied supplier for the AVEC? As, as far as purchasing new equipment, do you mean? No. A maintenance contract for servicing all the AVECs. So, so currently right now, the way the districts are set up are with an HVA, an in-house HVAC technician. Well, um, I, think, I think with the problems we've been having, I think we should investigate getting a contractor to come in once a month and review everything we got. I should think and, that would be cost, cost effective. And I agree with that 100%. And I've already made some phone calls and, and have some walkthroughs of our buildings. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that for Clark Wilkins in Village School is um, their oil fired units and uh, oil fired when it comes to HVAC is some somewhat of a specialty I'll say and we've brought them in and we've actually serviced those units already this year in preparation for winter. I will say that um, those units have not been serviced in over three years and typically an oil fired unit should be maintained every year. So I agree with your comments 100% and I'm, I'm looking at pursuing that ourselves. Okay, and I, I believe that should be shared across the district. Yes, I, I would, do. Yep, yep, it, not, not just one building should have um, that is correct. maintenance. All of, all of our buildings should have that as well. I, I agree with that 100%. Thank you. You're welcome. Good point, John, thank you. Thank you. Save money. All right, um, so that's basically the status of um, the Sohegan board update. Were there any questions? I just, I just have a quick that? question and a quick comment. Um, so Roger, thanks, thank you so much. Everything you just, everything you just said is, is so great to hear. Um, I am also curious about AMS. I know that was a South Hegan update. Um, are those systems similar to what we have at South Hegan? I know that when we did the walkthrough tour at AMS, there were, there were a lot of units kind of taped up and held together. And um, so it's exciting to hear, uh, you know, you getting, getting maintenance on all those and at Clark Wilkins and everything. I just was curious about AMS. Yes, so um, it's, it's the same style somewhat as far as unit ventilators and classrooms. I just actually took a tour with um, our, our engineering form that's working along with Lance and we actually took a tour of middle school Wilkins and Clark today and it was really eye opening for me. Um, not that I haven't been through these schools are already but it just was a really an in depth look with them. What we found in the unit ventilators at middle school is they actually have a 100 amp 480 volt feed to them. And what that means is that's just an extraordinary amount of power for one unit ventilator in a classroom. Apparently at some point they were actually electric heat units that have been converted to um, um, hot water units. And the feeds are still there. They're still coming out of the electrical panel. What we found today is we have an enormous amount of power that we're able to use at middle school because all of these unit ventilators have been converted at one point or another. They were actually set up at one point to take a cooling coil, but the cooling coil was never installed. It, it was just either a plan for the future. Um, but again, that design changed over the many changes that have been taken here. So I would say middle school's units are original, but they've been adapted over time to as they've gone through just the different phases of construction. Great, thank you. And yeah, just again, reminder that the the whole HVAC conversation, um, it, it, so, it so goes beyond COVID, right? Like we had students coming to school board meetings last year, pre-COVID, 
talking about the temperature fluctuations in the building. AMS is another one where one room is boiling hot, the next room is freezing. They're worried about things busting if there's a, you know, the snow day. So I just really want to put that out there for anyone who's watching. Um, I think the HVAC conversation has really um, gotten caught up with COVID and that's a small, really a small piece of why we're talking about this, right? Like we were talking about about the HVAC in all of these buildings well before um, we found ourselves in the current situation. And I, I also feel it also talks to how important just maintenance is and preventative yeah. maintenance. At the yeah. end of the day, we know this equipment is going to fail, but it's how long can we extend that life? How, how good can we keep it running and keep it clean and just be proud of our systems? And I feel that we're, we're on that path now. We have a lot of cleanup to do, but um, with all of us here and, and administration, we're, we're definitely on the right path. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's exciting. Stephanie, I see your hand up. Yeah, quick question, Roger. You, may, you mentioned that when you're going through the unit ventilators over at the high school that some of the things, so, something had been turned off and just never gone back to turn back on. Is this what's causing all the fluctuations in the temperatures in the different rooms? Does this mean that the HVAC system throughout the school isn't as, I'll say, bad as we think it is? And that was some of this maintenance that it's not a crisis anymore or is it it's still really really bad and that these maintenance things you're doing is just trying to make it okay i feel that we're we're getting ourselves back to almost a recommissioning point on the hvac um we've done an, the controls contractor we're working with now is just doing the controls portion so we definitely have to fix all of these mechanical issues but I will say if you go into a room and the fan has never worked and then all of a sudden we have a unit that's operating, to, to me, that's almost 100% turnaround. Um, I, I more lean towards Lance and the engineers as far as looking in, at these systems as we go deep into this to see are they appropriate? Where is their end of the life? Are we able to get them by for the time being to get us to this year? I think it's all of our input. But as far as... Um, Yes, I mean, you have overheating issues because a valve has just failed and the valve just, it's not turning off like with the thermostat like it's supposed to. And it just speaks to the preventative maintenance side is that's why we need the redundancy to always go back to these units and have an eye on it and just making sure that it's working properly. And I will say, um, I forget, I think it was John's comment about getting somebody in here to help us. And we have thousands of pieces of equipment to be maintained throughout all of our buildings. For one individual to do that and be able to keep up with it, that is a very, that's a big toll to ask. Um, and it's almost unrealistic. They're doing the best that they can, certainly. But I think it's, it's also an overwhelming feat to, to do that as one individual with all of our buildings. Oh, that, that's really good to hear too, knowing for budgeting going forward, understanding that piece. Thank you. Yeah, I agree, Stephanie. I think and, and maybe we do need Lance to weigh in, um, but it was recommended to the board that we do um, an HVAC replacement. So I guess we want to, as JFAC members, understand that, um, that that is definitely a need that needs to happen now. Um, and if that's not the case, if we're getting different information, then I guess we would need to know that. Um, so I'm wondering if, um, if maybe Lance, you can weigh in on the 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 status of the HVAC at Sohegan. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at the Sohegan 2.0 report, there's a full detail from mechanical engineers looking at your systems. Um, the high level is that your systems are beyond their life. Um, and although I think Roger is doing great work to because no matter what, he has to work with the systems he has every year. Um, engineers are all saying these systems are beyond their life. They're not efficient. They should be replaced whether you renovate and make upgrades to this building or not. Just as part of a maintenance plan, you should actually be replacing these systems. Um, the type of systems you have, the unit ventilators, are not particularly, um, they, they're very affordable and used quite a bit in schools, but they're not particularly energy efficient. Um, they do not change the air as much as a modern system does. They don't have um, the things that we like to see, like the MERV 13 filters availability that modern systems have, and they don't have the air changes per hour that we want in a new system. So 
when we look at those systems, those actually units are actually no longer under production as much. They're hard to find parts for um, because essentially the world has gone away from that technology. It is time to replace those systems. The Sauhegan project of Sauhegan 2.0 noted that they should be replaced under any condition. Um, and I think that's still true. Um, back to Brian's point, you know, the knee jerk reaction of let's just replace them because of COVID. Separate from COVID, you should replace them because of energy. You should replace them because of fresh air. You should replace them because essentially um, Roger's job is going to get harder and harder every year because the systems are beyond their life. Um, those are reasons to replace them. COVID is one of the things that just, I think, has a lot of districts saying, let's look pretty hard at these systems. And, uh, you know, is this, a, is this, you know, now another driving factor to doing this? But I think there's a lot of other reasons to replace those systems. Um, as was noted, there are some systems that have, that have parts that could be reused. There's a few systems that are 10 years old um, up on the rooftop units, and we would like to try to reuse some of those smaller um, rooftop units. But the majority of your systems are not something we would reuse and not something we would invest heavily in. Um, we're saying time to time to replace the system as a whole. I, I think we had data on this back last year, but didn't we have stats around like teacher absences and student absences and something to the effect of where we're a little bit, I guess, I don't know if it's higher or lower, we're a little bit higher on absentees uh, than average. And I would assume that a lot of that is corollary to you know, the HVAC systems in the various different schools. I mean, it can be, it's a, it could be a contributing factor, but Adam, am I correct to say we had some of those statistics? Yeah, so uh, um, going back, and I'll, I shared the story somewhere else last week, so I apologize for those who are, are hearing it a second time, but going back about six years ago, uh, Roger and I visited another school system in the state that has, uh, that had better absence data for both staff and students than the school district where I was working at the time. We wanted to learn how they were doing that, and they attributed a lot of it to their facilities. So Roger and I took a ride up uh, to the Plymouth School District, Plymouth, New Hampshire, and they explained to us all of their custodial practices, which were excellent. And they spent a lot of time showing us their HVAC systems, which included inline UV filters that filtered out virus and bacteria as part of the, the, the HVAC systems. And so um, before COVID, uh, my recommendation and part of the long-term HVAC needs were to install UV filters in line. So um, it's nothing new. It's what we had uh, uh, assumed would be best practice. Now it's going to be much easier to make people understand that that's the right thing to do given what we've been through. So um, uh, I would say that uh, none of this is, is, is unexpected. Great. Any questions? Right. Can, I, can I just add, I, I want to add on to something Lance said. So Lance, just make sure, clarify my understanding. And you said it so well when you talked about unit ventilators, but I just want the, the public to understand that, that at the time unit ventilators were installed in buildings, it's it, just in general, are these accurate statements? Unit ventilators are typically the cheapest to install at the time of construction, but the least efficient and hardest to repair and maintain in the long run. Are those fair statements? That is a fair statement. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to have us move on. Um, and I'm going to be turning it over to Lance. I know there's two proposals and that um, Okay. Right. Shannon, do you want to take over? <laughs> uh, yes, I believe you were just turning it over to Lance for his yeah. presentation um, regarding uh, Clark Wilkins and Amherst Middle School. Great. Can everybody see my screen okay? Great. So I'm going to go through um, the middle school update. I know we've, we've seen some plans last time and we reviewed those and we've made those changes. So I'm going to go through that and then I'll stop and we can comment on that. And then I'll get into some options we have to look at for Clark Wilkins School. All of this stuff was posted on the Slack um, and can be posted 
after this meeting um, to others who weren't able to get it. Um, and we pretty quickly through the front end here. Um, I know um, we did look at existing conditions last time. Um, we reviewed some of the conditions they're dealing with. Um, just as a reminder, the biggest things we heard about are these triangle shaped classrooms. You did, they didn't manage to shoehorn six classrooms into each wing, but they're undersized and they're very poorly utilized for education. Um, we had um, a lot of missing space and spaces kind of put into areas that are undersized. Um, we did the programming and I'm going to skip right ahead. Um, we landed last time talking about um, some of the layout of the of the middle school and the ideal having ideally having pods for each grade, two pods per grade um, and preferably one seventh and eighth grade split pod to be able to accommodate the population we're seeing coming down the, the pipe um, that is there now, as well as the, the, the population projections the district provided. So, sorry. So the solution that we've been working on um, does include renovation, full renovation of the building, and an addition to pick up um, the extra space we have based on the current population needs. Um, looking at this diagram, this is your existing building. We have a very modest addition at the front entrance, trying to create that secure entrance sequence and moving the administration close to it. We also have one two-story wing being added on. Um, you can see the building. Essentially, it does, it does look like it was set up to be able to take this wing, so it is a fairly efficient way to add a tie on a two-story area. That two-story area includes a public community entrance to the uh, maker space that's there, as well as a courtyard that we can set up there that we think would be supplemental to that use. In looking at the floor plan or the site plan, um, the community access to the innovation lab works well in that we could tie it to this main parking lot. So we would have an entrance on this side of the building. Um, that courtyard could be a positive space for students to be an outdoor learning area. Um, Anybody who's doing COVID planning, I'm sure, is telling you that they're trying to find every outdoor learning area they can um, for the short term that we have. Um, but outdoor learning areas have always been um, part of this school's curriculum. Right now, they exist down here, and we're trying to put some up close to the building so they can be used there. We're relocating the playground, and we're enhancing that main entrance. In looking at the main floor, um, you can see that the triangle-shaped classrooms all being renovated into proper-sized classrooms, full rectangular classrooms, and that gives us the ability that every um, wing here can create a team. Um, so a team is the four basic subject matters, two humanities, a math, and a science lab. Um, it does have their, um, um, their breakout spaces as well as case managers in the team, so the students are really staying in that cohesive body. Um, so we have sixth grade team, a seventh grade team. This is um, we, the addition. We've relocated the innovation lab to this side. That gives us the ability to house music over here, which is adequate size for music. Um, one of the complaints we had was the original music rooms are you know, grossly undersized. So we wanted to take this area and renovate that to those. Family Consumer Sciences stays here and life skills um, adjacent to it. Now the gymnasium and the cafeteria very much stay as they are. Upgrades to those do include HVAC, lighting, um, mechanical plumbing, um, things that we've been talking about all along, um, but this is the entirety of the building. Renovating um, over here, we were able to place one whole team here um, in the media center right there. Now the center of the building, we talked about having a learning commons there. So if each team kind of has about 100 students gathering into a team, the learning commons is kind of that whole school learning area. Um, it is an extension of the media center. It does have breakout space for both professional development as well as individual learning for students and teamwork. Um, but essentially we're taking right now that that school is actually a split level and that this is a half level up and a half level down on the left hand side. And we're using that to our advantage to create a kind of a multi level learning commons for students to be kind of the heart of the building. And I'll show you a rendering of that in just a moment. Now on the upper level, very efficient layout of space. Same thing on the lower level. We've got two teams that we also were able to create the other two teams that we need on this level. So the addition, which again is here, houses one whole team. That's that missing team that we have today to house the current student population to get our class numbers um, in check. 
exterior wise, and I know the committee may want to weigh in on this, this is just kind of a preliminary massing of that. This is that courtyard. If you were to approach from this side, you would see um, if you're going into the innovation lab, you'd go through this stair into that innovation lab. We were creating an entrance there um, in that courtyard in this area for students. Now, the nice thing about this is it does back up over against that property line. So it is an area that we could easily have a secure area for students, particularly inside that courtyard with a gate there. Um, but you can see general scale of the space and what the community would expect um, once it was built. Interior. So right now your library is here, but we're taking that library out and we're pushing it back. This is that interior learning commons. Now, as I noted, if you come in the main door in that middle school, you're actually a half a level between each. So you've got a level up and a level down. We're using that to our advantage. So we're creating some risers there for students to be able to sit and you can do presentations. Um, this is strikingly similar to the SNHU sandbox that many of your educators actually saw and said, I really want to do this with my students. I wanna be able to house these types of meetings. But you can see very flexible space and whether you're doing a presentation to um, an entire grade level or two grade levels or whether you're just having kids meet out here as part of an active learning lunch that they're trying to create or whether you're trying to just have groups of classes that have breakout space and work in collaboration space, um, that's what we're setting the core of this building up. We are setting conference rooms off that. That gives us the maximum amount of flexibility that in the future, whether it's special education needs or whether it's meeting needs or whether it's um, specific curriculum needs, that we've got these good sized rooms that can be designated to any of those things. Um, so we're really trying to be as flexible as possible and the administration has said, just give us those flexible spaces and we can use the building and let it morph as our curriculum morphs year to year. Um, so we're trying to do that. Now sight lines have been a major issue for us. So we did say we want to be able to have some control points like this that you can see into all those areas um, and that the students kind of, as, no matter where you go in the building, you've always got some eyes on those students. So if we're having these meeting spaces that students can definitely go in there, but you do have a visual observation direct to them. So the, the big tough one is the costs. Um, so for this first round, I did, um, did speak with Adam and say, we should probably provide some order of magnitude costs. So what I've provided is costs based on this full renovation of this project. And these are based on historic cost per square foot in New Hampshire. Um, these are not, we have not had, we do have a construction estimator on our team. When we turn him loose, as in when we're done the design and we think this is what we want, they will do a very detailed cost. They can do the breakouts like we're doing at South Hegan now, where we say, geez, I wanna phase this project out or I wanna do just the HVAC now and then some of these other um, upgrades later. We what, can do that what, at this what time. Lance, what Lance is trying to say is that he's not a construction estimator and his numbers are high because he's trying to make sure he doesn't come in too low. Okay. Correct. Right. No one's going okay. to yell at me if the price goes down. <laughs> <laughs> and so with that, if you were to do this whole project all at once based on average cost per square foot, you're talking about about $32 million in construction. If you include soft costs, that's furnishings, engineering, fees, um, contingencies to ensure that we, we don't go over budget and that we you know, can do the project properly, it'd be about 42 million. And again, I've carried a 30% allowance on that. It's anywhere between 20 and 30% on the average project. And it really comes down to how much furniture do we need as part of this project and some of those other things. And so with that, I'd love to turn it over to the group to get feedback. I can jump over to any slides you have questions on or- Lance, I have, I have one. Do you have a duration for this size project? How long would this take if we went with everything? I don't, I can get that for you though. Um, I'm working with yeah. Harvey Construction as our estimator and they're working on the Sowegan project right now and they're working on durations there. Um, I think primarily the question will be that will drive the duration is for the renovation, how much of the building can I have at once? Right. So obviously you wouldn't want to go do one room at a time. You know, that would, we'd be done about the time we need to start again. Um, the, the big question is, is phasing. And I think that's something that I'll need to sit down with you, um, Adam and the principal and say, what, you know, how many classrooms can you live without so that we can take a construction management crew and march through this building and phase by phase. Of course, I mean, I know summers we get the full use of the project or full use of the site, but during the school year, we really want to be in phases there. And the bigger phase you can get, the shorter the construction duration is going to be. 
So um, to be determined, but it, it's not something that would be done in a single year. I can put it that way. Okay, thank you. So I don't have a question, but maybe more statement and I'm probably stating quite the obvious. Um, it's obvious the fifth graders will need to be at Wilkins for this project to move forward. So I know you're gonna present that next, but it goes without saying, we need to probably focus on that shift prior to getting this shift done. Is that what you're thinking, Lance? It is, I think we need to create, no matter where we focus our project, if we wanna do the middle school first, district-wide, we need to focus on creating space um, so that we can do, so we can make the, you know, the dominoes fall. Um, if the group said, I really want to do, you know, an addition at the middle school first, then that would alleviate and, you know, the fifth grade short term so we could go to Wilkins, but Wilkins has the most growth right now. So I would say that the first phase has to create space. Wilkins has the, the, the ability to create the most space. Okay. Thank you. So Shannon had a, had her hand up. Thank you. Um, so in addition to creating space, which we desperately need at Clark Wilkins and at the middle school, can you talk about what this plan does for the efficiencies of the building? Right, like, are, so systems wise, like, you know, obviously this is, this is a lot, this is a huge investment that towns make very rarely. Um, so what what do we gain from making this investment in in the middle school specifically are, are there any efficiencies gained there um, in terms of operating the building yeah there will be energy efficiencies i mean we are proposing full new hvac full new lighting um, we can make significant energy i can look to the engineer to try to map out what our expected savings can be but i will also say that we are producing significantly more air in this system so as part of just like at the high school the modern codes and modern systems create much healthier much healthier environments, which means more air changes per hour, more air per pupil, um, more fresh air. Um, so there will be energy efficiency upgrades, but there's also going to be some added air that goes into that. So I don't want to say that your energy is going to be cut in half because we're going to be heating more air, cooling more air as part of that system. So, but I will look to our engineer to try and state what those energy savings might be and kind of make a detailed list of what energy projects would be, would be doing. Uh, that would be interesting and helpful, I think, um, to folks to know. And then um, I'm sure it's somewhere in here. I was like, had my magnifying glass out on some of these, but on average, um, what's the difference in classroom size um, from, from where we are now to like, what are we getting? What are we going sure. from with those triangles? Yep. Um, so, We'll go right up to the triangles. So your triangles are really yeah. about that 850. Mm -hmm. So 850, um, we are going, what we're proposing is a state standard is 900 square feet for a general classroom, lecture style, discussion style. And we're going 1,000 square feet in a science classroom because we've got a lab um, going on in that room. So we're talking about between 50 and, um, and 150 square feet increase in every room. I would also note the efficiency of these spaces. Um, it may be 850 square feet, but if you look at how these rooms are used, they are more, this much of that room is used. Right, yeah. You know, because this is a corner, it's a corner. You know, this is where you walk in, so the teacher is teaching here, and then that's kind of their space. So it's not just how many square feet, it's also how many usable square feet do we have. Thank you. Sure. Other questions in the middle school plan? I'm happy if the group would rather go to the Clark Wilkins School and then come back, I'm happy to do that too. Lance, well, I just had a question and it's probably yeah. dovetails into both projects, but you know, obviously the lifespan of the schools that we have today have, are nearing end of life. Um, you, with the design and the construction changes that have happened over the last 34 years, what's the lifespan expectancy of these types of buildings if properly maintained? So based on the project that I've estimated, I've essentially as, as assumed that we're going to replace every system with a lifespan under 30 years. So that's new windows, new roof. Um, this building properly maintained can last, you know, 
significant period, but there are some systems that need to be replaced. So as an example, your roof. Um, your roof, we can get a roof with a 25 year warranty. Um, you really wanna be replacing it right, uh, pretty close to that warranty period. About 25 to 30 years is when you want a new roof on this building. Um, windows, I tend to say the same thing. Now windows, they're great, but after about 25 years, we start to see a lot of movement in those windows and we start to see a lot of the panes start to break. Um, so, you know, the walls, they're forever. Um, the, you know, the mechanical systems tend to be about a 25 to a 30 year life cycle on those, um, depending on the system. Lighting, lighting usually is about a 25 year life cycle. Um, really the driver for light replacement tends to be technology. Has the light technology come so far that even if we have good age, good LED or good um, fluorescent lights, shouldn't we replace them to LED to save money? So I would say anything, most of the systems are about a 25 to 30 year life cycle. Any other questions related to the middle school? I have a quick question. Um, it, it really it probably isn't a Lance question, but um, it has to do with how long um, a bond would would, um, would be considered for a project of this size. Yeah, I, I can I can answer that. So um, it's it's governed by RSA thirty three two, um, which uh, I think it's. Let me just double check that because I want to make sure I get this right. Um, yes, it's 33.2, um, which says that the repayment on the principal um, can be no later than 30 years after the date issued or the, uh, the life or the, the, the um, lifespan of the work itself. So if we, if we installed something that was only expected to last 10 years, then we would have to pay it off within 10 years. Um, but we, uh, if something's expected to last 30 years or more, we could pay it off over 30 years as a maximum. Um, and the school board would determine that at the time they issue the bonds based on the interest rate at the time. And that's a determination they would make, although certainly would be um, something that would be factored into all the other projects that'll be coming down the pike and how they can all be sequenced together. And that's, frankly, that's a great question because that's something I'm hoping this committee will work through as a long-term financing plan that provides a steady, even tax rate to the taxpayers. Thank you. So question, my question for the group on this project is first, would you like me to move forward with getting detailed cost estimating on this project as it stands today? And following up with that, how would you like that cost estimating to be broken out? Do you want it to be broken out as similar to the high school, which would be an HVAC project, um, a security project, the additions, and then the pods, or is there other ways, or do we, does this group feel that there are different ways they would package this project? Lance, I guess I would be curious, in your mind, what's the most logical way to package this? So my, my biggest question is, do we do HVAC first? Um, and it really comes down to the appetite of, of the taxpayers. Do we want to do an HVAC project up front on this project? Um, because unlike the high school, we are moving a lot of walls in the middle school. So that's a, and I think it will, it will be a little bit more difficult to do that. To me, the, the first thing to do is create the new space and then to look to renovate um, the, the wings, the triangle classrooms, because the, the, I mean, if you remember, the, the three biggest things we're fighting that everybody said on their complaints, I mean, we know as a group that we, we need more space. We know that the HVAC systems are end of life and that was our second biggest complaint. Our biggest complaint was the triangle classrooms, um, the, the adequately, appropriately sized space. So those three things to me make sense to do under any project. Um, and I would think, you know, the question is, which one's more important? I don't know. I, I don't know if anybody on this call says, well, I think we do this than that. And I look to this group to, to advise. Um, I can certainly break them out separately, but you you will drive costs up if you break it into too many phases realistically, as in let's do this in seven phases, you'll you'll remobilize seven times um, and reopen that site. 
my opinion, and you know, I'm happy to give them. We lack space, right? That's been one of the biggest concerns is that there's an inadequate amount of space. We're going to be doing this, my assumption is, while there are children in, in buildings and faculty and staff, right? So we've got to figure out ways to balance the spatial needs with safety. So how can we increase space without having the reliance of trucking in a bunch of trailers that we're going to put you know, classrooms into? Because that's, at some point, I assume that's what's going to have to happen. So you're going to be putting students in trailers because you're working on buildings. So my my opinion would be that you'd want to create the additional space to minimize, you know, any excess costs that you had to expand on, whether it's for trailers for short term durations of time during construction, or you know, expand some of the space that as we start to flex and move students around building sites, um, we we have the ability to do that because between AMS. Clark Wilkins, we're talking about multi years of construction in our school system, and, and that's going to be highly disruptive. Just to be clear, my goal would be to not invest in the in trailers and portables. My goal would be to phase this project so that we never throw money out like that. Okay. Um, I could work easily with the with the principal. Um, there are, I mean, we we recently did Salem High School. It was eight phases of construction. They used every square inch of the building. The way we did that is we partitioned off one of their gyms into classrooms for one semester. It wasn't a long-term fix. Those classrooms did have ceilings in them and doors. You know, for the most part, they were the teachers were adequately served in those classes, so were the students. Um, but we could do the same thing with your principal here and say, maybe we subdivide the cafeteria up and in for one semester the students eat in rooms or same thing with the gym, probably not during basketball season, but there could be phases that we can do that. Um, same thing with your media center. I think we could phase this as a single project and never put in portables. My bigger question for phasing is, do we think that the community would, would seek this as a bond project as a single bond article, or do you think it would be phased as in one bond article to do half the renovations and another bond article 10 years down the road to do the other half? That was my question for this group. Will the community support a bond this big? So can I jump in on that? Um, and, and my answer is I have no idea, but, I think our job is to come up with a funding plan, as I mentioned before, that provides a consistent tax impact. And we really can't do that until we get cost estimates for these various parts of the projects. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem, but we really need Lance from Harvey. We need those um, somewhat dialed in, um, not order of magnitude costs that we can then start to do a, a, um, a funding plan and a tax analysis to figure out how that could possibly work. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree, Adam, and um, and this is one one district for Clark Wilkins and AMS, so I think we need to look at Clark Wilkins in conjunction with this. Yep. Okay, so what I'll do is ask for the, just to put the middle school, I'll schedule a meeting with the principal and you, Adam, to talk about for you know, how we would phase this as a single project. And then I'll turn in, that'll be with Harvey Construction. Harvey Construction will put dollars in detail to all of this, including that phasing. Um, and we'll, we'll attempt to break out some pieces of the project so this group can look at it. And Lance, I'm guessing that all this can't really start until we figure out where fifth grade is going, right? Because- Correct. Yeah. yeah no, the, the phasing here is going to tie to the phasing at the other school, mm -hmm. no matter how we do it. So, so if this group, I mean, as you, as you said, it's one district and you have the same amount of kids, whoever's not here is there and vice versa. So let's, let's hop over. Is the is group comfortable moving to Clark Wilkins? I'm happy to come back here if you think of questions you forgot. Yeah, if we can move, move along. I know Adam has a hard stop at 540 and there's an SEU board meeting at six. So um, we don't have a ton of time. Okay. Not the slide I wanted to open on. Okay, so Clark Wilkins, I'm gonna skip right through the existing conditions. We did talk about it at the last meeting a fair amount. Um, we have two options to look at for Clark Wilkins. Um, ultimately, just to reiterate to everybody out there, we said at the last meeting, the Clark School has a myriad of issues. It is not, um, it is a structure that needs so much work um, and at the end of the day, it does not have adequately sized space, even if we were to make it like new, um, that I, under any of these scenarios, I could not find a good 
use for that building as part of it. It cannot fit a house on entire grade. It does not have accessibility um, for some of the single departments. It really do, isn't a building I'm recommending that you expand and upgrade, period. Um, our engineers visited and said the same thing. I wouldn't invest in this facility. Um, it is a limited site. So all of our solutions that we're gonna look at today are actually on the Wilkins site. Um, and so with that, um, we do have an- Hey Lance, Lance, just real quick, I just wanna chime in, I'm sorry. Just as far as Clark, we as we looked at it, we were looking at it as a school building, correct? So we're, we're saying Clark does not work for us as a school, but that building might be um, adequate for, for other, for maybe the town or turning it over to someone. I just want to make that clear as far as it doesn't work for us as a school. Right, it's education. It doesn't work great as education space. So if the building were to be used as a community center or anything else, um, a, a private business, something else, it would not, it, it may be worth upgrading, but for us to meet our requirements for schools, it is not worth our, our, us upgrading. And so looking at the Wilkins site, um, it's a great site. You have two locations that are buildable. The upper field is under conservation easement, um, but the lower field is very flat, very developable. Um, you do have good access to it, and you have a single-story building um, that has a lot of um, a lot of space that's actually well sized. It does need new HVAC systems, and it's at the end of its life on some of those various systems we talked about. Um, You can see a few undersized spaces there, and primarily your undersized spaces really come down to the kindergarten, first, and second grade, where when meeting with educators, they said we really should be doing um, a, um, a lab type classroom that is 1,200 square feet, and those classrooms are a little bit small for that. They're actually adequately sized for a fourth and fifth grade classroom, which is a little bit different method of teaching. So going from that information um, and remembering that Ultimately, each of these grade levels um, does need several classrooms more than they have today um, to get you back to your class sizes that you want to keep. We know that we need significant space if we look at pre-K through fifth grade, um, a significant amount of classrooms that don't exist today. The first solution we had was, what if we use the existing building? And the existing building, when we looked at it, can fit fifth and sixth grade pretty well. It cannot fit any more than that. It's a two grade building, works really well for that. And then we took and built a new building for preschool through third grade. In that scenario, you would use the site. Now, I, I haven't engaged our civil engineer yet, but you do have some wetlands here and you have a slope there. So you've got some constraints. It's not to say these are hard constraints. These are constraints that the reason we use a civil engineer is to tell us how much room do we actually have here before we start getting fined? And how much room do we have here before we start paying major fees and moving earth? Um, but we've, we've been conservative and kind of stayed within the, uh, the field footprint that we're working with um, to put this building here to see how we could fit it. On this scenario, we've proposed a drop-off on this side for parents and a drop-off on this side for buses. That allows both students, no matter what grade you're in, um, both schools to use those same drop-offs. So people that were dropping off here for fourth and fifth grade, and then here for pre-K um, pre through three and back out. And on this side, bus could drop here for fourth and fifth grade and here for um, pre-K through three. Overall site plan, this is what it looks like. You can see we did connect this with pedestrian areas. Now all the tan areas are hardscape. That's to say that we can run emergency vehicles. We can put a fire truck around here. We can put an ambulance. We can put maintenance vehicles all the way around the school. I know one of the early questions someone asked is could we upgrade this? We definitely can upgrade this around um, if we want to. I would always recommend gating that. Um, we don't want schools to kind of have a racetrack around them and we want students to have access to outdoor areas like the field and outdoor environments. Um, but we do have the ability to do that and that's something I can work with the um, civil engineer on. Um, so emergency access does come around and you can see a very efficient layout of space here. Um, a two-story design. Now on the existing building, um, we're talking about upgrading the systems that are end of life. 
Um, but other than that, you can see a lot of these, all these walls that are gray, those are existing walls we're leaving. We're taking out a couple classrooms to create um, the space we needed, um, whether it's small group space um, that the teachers said they need, or whether it's um, you know, expanding to a larger music room in this area. So you can see a few new partitions and a few partitions missing from the space. We are trying to locate the administration over at the main entrance so that we can create a secure main entrance sequence that comes through. That did give us the ability, the administration, for those of you who don't remember, is right here inside the building. That gave us the ability to open that up and create a small kind of lobby learning commons there that is the heart of this school. Not huge, it's about the size of two classrooms there, but it's at least a good gathering space for students right next to the administration, right next to the gym. Um, that could also serve pretty well for community use of the gym, of having a lobby and restrooms right outside that gym. That allowed us to relocate the media center here. Our core areas, whether it's my time, guidance, or computer labs, all specific to fourth and fifth grade, with our fourth grade in this wing and our fifth grade here. In the new building, which you can see, I'm saying there it's a new building, but I think a lot of the the feedback from the group last time, as well as the educators we met with, is that the Clark Wilkins should maintain a one school philosophy. So even though there's two buildings here, um, we really tried to link them very strong. Now remember, they have several um, specialty educators and um, assistants in special education um, that travel from building to building. So we wanted these buildings to be close and kind of feel that one, you know, as the single campus, a one school one school philosophy. So these two buildings, very close together, they do have enough for emergency access between, but this is where your administration is and your lobby is for the new building. On the first floor, we created our gym up front so that we could get good community use of that. It's the closest to the parking lot. We have our cafeteria and our kitchen there as well. Administration sets up for a secure entrance through that lobby. On first floor, by code, we have to have kindergarten and first grade and preschool all on the first floor. So those are the spaces we put on the first floor along with their music. Um, so all those spaces fit out on that first floor with a central core that comes right down the center. On the upper floor, that leaves us stacked with second grade and third grade, um, along with some of the special education departments that serve them, as well as the media center that serves them. Art is up here as well. Um, and some of the some of the refinement that we have to do and work through with the um, principal is would does the first grade need to use this art room or would they be okay using a music and art or doing art down in the music room here or doing art somewhere on this first floor because remember that we cannot send the first and kindergarten kids up to the upper floor so that's something I'd like to kind of review a little bit further with the principal and understand how would, how would you make that work or do we need to create another art room on this first floor? So a little bit of refinement. I don't anticipate to have major cost impacts. It's just as we go through these plans, refining them more and more each time. So that's essentially option A. And I'm gonna move right to option B and I think we can talk about both options at the same time. Just get them all out there. So option B was one of the group had asked, last time. So we're renovating this, this building and we're spending significant dollars to do so. Would we be better off just to abandon it and build a new building? It's a single story building now um, and it can't, we can't expand upward because structural codes have changed since the building was built. So we can't just go up. I know that's a common question people have. Um, no, we cannot do that cost effectively. Essentially we'd be building a new building on stilts over it um, and we wouldn't want kids in that building. But should we consider just building a new building? Obviously the phasing is much simpler now when we're doing a new building. Um, so if you look at this dashed line, you'll see the existing footprint of Wilkins School. And you'll see that our new building overlaps it very little. And the way we set that up was that essentially Wilkins School could stay operational until we built this entire building with the exception of its main lobby. Once, once the, the building was in, we moved the kids over, we knock Wilkins down, we move the kids in, we use the side entrance for six months while we build the main lobby. So phases very simply. In this case, we have the ability, because now we're, we're building a building that is pre-K through fifth, we have the ability to make a three-story building. There are some nice things about a three-story building. They tend to be more cost-effective because they have less exterior skin and they tend to be more energy efficient. Again, less exterior skin. You're talking about you know, one roof that's serving three floors, so less heat loss. Um, with that, on this scenario, we would have the ability to create an athletic field 
in its old location. Now we do have an athletic field here, so we would balance our athletic fields for the community um, because the old building would come down, athletic field out front. What we're proposing here, again, kindergarten, preschool, first grade on the first floor. Um, by code required, that makes sense. Um, we, we put a double gym here because on, on the old scenario, we had a single gym because we also have the gym from Wilkins. Here, curriculum wise, we actually need two gyms. So we put both gyms together and it could be um, an operable, um, operable curtain in between. So you could open up and have a bigger gym space for bigger community events. Um, you have a larger cafeteria because it's serving a greater student body um, on like two cafeterias and then you have one kitchen, um, one kitchen and one music room all on that first floor, along with a lobby, administration, and secure entrance sequence that does that. We put the administration right up front. Um, just to be clear, we're showing these circle plans like this. Um, that's just to say we want to do something special there. That's not to say this is your final design and it's going to be a circle. Um, we're just going to do that as a placeholder for some design. I see Adam smiling. Um, some design that we want to be able to do in the future, and we don't want to estimate a metal box up front. So on the upper floor, the gyms are two-story, as is the cafeteria, um, but we have the STARS program guidance. We have a media center up over the main entrance of the admin, so you could um, go directly up to that. We have our music area stacked. We have a computer lab on each floor, an art lab on each floor, and that serves the second and the third grade on this level. That leaves the third level, which is the fourth and the fifth grade. Again, they have their own smart maker space, their computer lab, their own computer lab, um, their own my time space, all stacked each floor. Um, so pretty efficient space. We are proposing that there is some natural light that could come down through the center. That's something we'd want to review as we refine the design with um, administration to say, you know, what is this space used for? Are we better to suit a common area or do we want a skylight that comes down through? Um, both have their pros and cons, and I think we have the flexibility to do either. And so with that, again, as you know, the cost numbers I've done myself, not with the construction estimator, so I kept them high. Um, option A, when you're renovating, you're spending about, um, on option A, you can see there's about $10 million in renovation in um, total, and about $50 million in new construction, so a $64 million project. So it's a $49 million in hard construction, which gives you about a $65 million project. If you do option B, all you spend all your money on new construction, you got $56 million in new construction, which is about a $73 million project with soft costs. So with that, I'll turn it over to the group to talk. I would start with option A versus B, and then we can refine and start talking about which option is preferred, or I would recommend, but it's up to the group. So probably not a lot of time for questions, but maybe a couple, and then we're going to have to wrap it up on um, next steps, unfortunately. Lance, option A, we're running two mechanical systems. We're running two of everything when we go to a separate building, or are you looking to take the feed from the existing school? No, we're proposing two of everything. We could definitely look at a boiler plant that would maybe serve both. Um, I'd have to talk further with Yetin about being able to do that, but our initial thought was that it would be two of everything. Okay. What's um, square footage compared from option A to option B? Uh, strikingly similar. Uh, I don't have it offhand. Um, just adding up total, total square foot, 170,000 square feet on option A, 166,000 on option B. So option B is slightly less square feet because we can do everything right on a new construction. I do have it offhand, I guess so. Thank you. Go ahead, Jeannie. Um, yeah, I'll, I personally am leaning towards option B just because I think it makes the most sense. Um, I know it's more expensive, but um, it just seems to, um, you know, meet all of our needs um, in a practical fashion. Um, I, I did have a question, Lance, about, because I know architects love to put in angles and do all kinds of interesting things because squares are boring. But um, is, is that wall that's angled um, at the front of the building that has the cafeteria and all of that, is that necessary? Because I know we're taking the angles away from, you know, the middle school. So I'm just trying to figure out why we'd want to do that here. We can straighten that wall out, not an issue. Okay. Um, 
does it have anything to do with the slope you're building next to? Yeah, I, we were, so the reason we're doing that is there's the slope and we're trying to maximize it right on that site. As you can guess, we could likely straighten that out. Um, I want to work with our civil engineer. As I said, yes, we could do it, but let me look at our look at it with our civil engineer. If our civil engineer is willing to give me a little bit more here, then I can get that straightened out. But it's not nearly as severe as the triangle classrooms that we have at the middle school. All right, I see Tom's hand up. You have a quick question. Hey, more of a uh, just a statement and just a confirmation from Adam. Uh, the number one is not only are we doing two of the boiler plant, you know, two of the facilities and, and the systems and all that, but you have two kitchens, two kitchen staffs, you, unless you're going to run them back and forth, which saves no efficiencies from what we're doing at Clark and Wilkins right now. Um, the other point is, Adam, offhand, I don't have this in my stack of papers here. I don't have the number of teachers that um, Amherst has in its district right now, but that building calls for 56 plus whatever specials are in there. So that is a significant increase over what we currently have, correct? So not only we're we looking at the bonding on this for X million per year, but we're looking at probably millions in, in additional staffing too, correct? Well, uh, two, two points there. So uh, you already honed in on the first thing, which is to compare our, the capital expenditure as opposed to the operational expenditures with, with construction projects, because a cheaper construction project is often more expensive to operate in the long run. And you've already figured that out. Two boiler plants, two lunch staffs, you know, all of that stuff. So that's uh, one thing we have to do is do a, a CapEx versus OpEx comparison to, to, to Jeannie's point about what's the long-term best um, investment. And then second, um, you're right, we are short on teachers. Um, however, I will say that this COVID-19 thing that we've done we have class sizes at the elementary level of around 15 in most places by redeploying all of our staff the way that we have with our pods. And the reason that's worked is because about a third of our, well, a little bit less, but 30% of our kids are home and aren't requiring class space. So uh, it's, it's probably not as, there are probably are some additional staff. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not trying to say we don't need additional staff. What I'm saying is, I'm really intrigued by how we've solved this problem that we're in right now because we've achieved the class sizes we want with, with one or two additional staff. Um, and we're gonna be, I'm gonna be curious how it works with special education in particular, but I'm not sure that, it's, that we're way off. I saw Brian's hand up. Um, did you have a quick question, Brian? If I heard Lance correctly, he kind of wanted to get guidance from us and probably maybe tonight on a versus B. And I think if we can hone in on that, I know we only got a few minutes left. I'll, I'll vote for B. I think looking at it aesthetically, but also from just a, a cost perspective, you have less, you know, you're maximizing real estate space by creating more open space for, for fields and the like. You're, you're increasing the capacity of the school, but you're stacking it. So you're, you're decreasing safety issues. I mean, if you have a massive building like in proposal A, you've got a lot of perimeters that you have to surveil for, for safety purposes. You know, if you're replacing roofs twice. You're, there's a lot of maintenance costs with option A that won't necessarily hit us up front, but we're going to be paying a lot for it on the back end. So, I mean, if we could start to hone in on which options we want, I think that's the plan. Is that what you're looking for for us tonight? Absolutely. I vote B. I vote B as well. So, Lance, how, um, how problematic is it to get costing on both options? I can. But I can, you're talking about detailed costing on both options? Well, no. go ahead, let me, Adam. Let me jump in. I, I would say I'm, I'm, if I'm hearing, if the group, is, what you're saying is representative of everybody in this committee, it sounds like there needs to be a focus on B, but our community is going to want to know how far different it is from A. So we're going to have to get some, not maybe the same level of detail, but something a little bit closer so that we're, we're we can speak truthfully about what the difference in cost is. Yeah, we're, we're just going to need to be able to do that analysis, Lance. I can, I can do that. So what I would propose is let me get detailed 16 division, you know, trade by trade estimates on B. Um, if we do the same thing for the middle school and we can apply what we learned at the middle school on cost for renovation to renovation of this building um, with similar systems and then do an analysis um, applying those costs to to the renovation and also update that cost at the same time. Can I just get a, just do a quick straw poll, um, you know, real first blush uh, choice, A or B? 
because I, I just heard from two people. Yeah, so I'll jump in. Um, B, B, and that's not where my head was when I looked at this initially, um, but I think it, it makes the most sense in terms of you know everything that was just mentioned. I'm not gonna cover that all again. Um, something I think we definitely need to talk more about though is um, Clark and why it doesn't work as a school. I think that's gonna be really important to share with folks whose kids have gone through there and said, hey, it worked for my kid. Um, why doesn't it work as a school today? Like I have my own feelings. I understand why it doesn't work, but I wanna talk more about that um, at the next meeting. And I think we need to meet sooner than a month out. So let's go through quick straw poll. And then, mm -hmm. yes, I agree we should meet as soon as Lance has um, those cost estimates. So just real quick, Ellen, A or B? I feel a little pressure to pick B. I'm kind of undecided. Okay, that's fine. Stephanie? Um, I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards B because I like the idea of one roof, one mechanical system, one kitchen, those maintenance costs. We see them now. If we have two buildings, there's times two. Hey, Amy, can I just do yeah. a little bit of size, Stephanie? Um, so my only concern with B is we don't have any other schools that are three stories. Um, and when we're talking elementary schools on a third floor, it just makes me a little nervous. I would assume there's also elevators. There are. Mm -hmm. So I don't like the separation and I don't like the younger kids being in the back and having to walk to the nurse's office in plan A. So that's kind of, you would have to yeah. switch them around. The little kids would have to be in the front of the building, um, closer to the office. They're not going to be able to walk outside. Yeah. Jeannie, and I'm sorry to be pushing. I, I know we just know. That's okay. I, I already indicated that I, I favored B. Okay, that's right. Sorry. Okay, so that gives you some indication, Lance. Oh, John. B. B. Okay. <laughs> All right. What I'll do. Thanks, what everyone. I'll do. So, yeah, so if you can keep, when you think you'll get it, do a Slack and we'll get a meeting set up imme immediately. Um, go ahead. I'll talk to the construction estimator tomorrow. I've got him working right now on Sauhegan 2.0 stuff. Um, next, I'll stack him with this project in the middle school, and I'll have him give me dates as to when I will have, we'll have the first round of numbers, and we'll schedule meetings. Um, yeah. He's going to do one building, then the next, so it might be that this group can meet to review the cost estimates on Clark Wilkins School first, and then the cost estimates on the middle school second. Um, so we can do those meetings and kind of have, you know, less things on the agenda, but just focus right on those in the conference. Okay. John, I was remiss in, um, in calling on you. Hey. John D'Angelo. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a liaison, not a member, so I don't actually get a vote. But listening well, to all of this, your opinion, though. I think in an ideal world, B is better because it is one roof, one heating plant, and so on. I also think that if you'd run the operations cost versus the construction cost, you're going to discover when you look at security and all the rest of that, that it's just a much better deal to have one building that is new uh, and has had the security built into it from the start. Having said that, uh, that's a lot of money, and uh, it'll be the only three-story building in Amherst. The good news is our ladder truck can get to a three-story building, so if there's a fire, we got covered. But uh, it is, in fact, the only three-story building we've got in the town. Great. Great feedback. All right, so I think we have a plan. And sorry to cut everybody off, but Adam's got to switch over to the next meeting. And um, I'll see some of you all at 6. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. Bye. Thank